On this episode of Crystal and Corked, I sit down and have a conversation with my mentor, my friend, my old boss, Ted Teal. I started in the independent retail industry, uh, in 2010, because of Ted, he sent me an email and uh, he was starting a company called Snap Retail and they were looking for somebody who knew social media. And I ended up meeting him in Atlanta at America's Mart and he invited me to join the team. And that was one of the best decisions I have ever made. It was an honor to work with him. I learned so much from him. You're going to see just a tiny bit of his education and knowledge when it comes to business and marketing and digital marketing in this episode, uh, which I know that you're going to just love. But I'm so grateful that we've stayed in contact over these years. He is such a brilliant business um, mind and is just my friend. And so a little bit more about Ted. We, uh, you can find him on LinkedIn. We're going to link to that on the show notes. He has over 25 years experience with technology companies. He is an expert in digital marketing, which you're going to hear a little bit of that on this episode today. He is a passionate leader and mentor. Um, I've always felt his heart for building the team and being fair and being, um, he would always say, mutual trust and respect. And I just learned so much from him. And I I so know that that's just part of his makeup. Uh, He's a Harvard uh, Harvard BA and MBA, finishing top 5% in his class, which I'm not surprised. He is such a a brilliant business mind. That's what I always say about Ted Teal. Um, He's traveled to 60 countries, just 60, 47 states, and loves yoga. He also lives one mile from the ocean, and I get to see his fabulous pictures on Facebook. I'm like so jealous of the time he spends on the beach, even though I'm only four miles from my ocean here. I never go. He goes every day, and you can tell it's just therapy for him. Um, so in this episode, we talk about growing a business, like foundationally, what do you need kind of in the beginning? And there are a lot of pieces that you need. We talk high level about why those are so important. We go into how to scale a business. If you are more established and you're ready to take it up a notch or two, you're going to get a lot of value out of the tips today. We talk about risk taking, managing your team. And then Ted has some parting advice at the very end of this episode that I think is so critical to a business's success if you have employees. And I would encourage you to take this advice and use it personally as well, not just professionally. So you got to watch the whole episode because you need to hear this advice at the end. Um, also mentioned at the end, Ted works with Kaleidoscope. Uh, they help orthodontists with digital marketing. So if you are an orthodontist, have a family or friend member who is, make sure that they check out the kaleidoscope.com. We'll also link to it. All right, let's dive into this episode. Hello, I'm Crystal Vilkaitis. I'm a curious, wine-loving entrepreneur who loves to learn and have open and honest conversations. Join me and my amazing guests as we talk about all sorts of relatable business and life stuff. It's my goal that you'll have fun, learn something new, and get inspired. Wine is not required, but is recommended. This is Crystal Uncorked. Mr. Ted Teal, welcome to Crystal Uncorked. I'm so thrilled you're here. I'm thrilled to be here, Crystal, and I'm so proud of you, what you've accomplished. Uh, you, you really are, uh, you, you've really done a lot of amazing things. Thank you, Ted. Well, I have learned a lot from you, and I know that our listeners are going to learn some good stuff from you today, too. Before we dive in, Ted and I are drinking coffee today. We yes. are recording a little bit earlier. Well, so cheers. It's coffee with Crystal for this episode. Uh, wine it is my fun. second. <laughs> right, right. But it is my second cup and normally I only have one. So we'll see. Maybe it, we get a little crazy know. here. We get a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so Ted and I, we know each other 
many years ago when we worked together at Snap Retail. He founded Snap Retail, reached out to me through a, a, somebody he was mentoring. It was a client of mine and invited me to be on the team. And that's how I got into this independent retail space like I share all the time. I mean, I never left it, Ted. You invited me in and I have yeah. just stayed. <laughs> Um, but you have always, I'll never forget because we, we worked together for almost two years, but I was back, uh, in, in Pittsburgh for a wedding and you and I got coffee and you're, you said, do you have a dollar? And I was like, yeah. And you're like, okay, give me the dollar. So I gave you the dollar and you're like, okay, you just paid your fee. You now can have me as your mentor, like whatever, you know, you've paid your dues. Now I can help you if you ever have questions. And that really did mean a lot though, because I have reached out. You've helped me along these years. Happy to um, do it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I hope it's worth um, the price you paid anyway. <laughs> no, it's like, it's way worth. I got a killer deal on that dollar. Uh, I have really, really milked that dollar. <laughs> um, so Ted, I shared more about you in the intro, but you have built and scaled businesses for many years now, sold multiple businesses. I know you've sold at That's least true. one, right? Yeah. Okay. That's true. Um, yeah. So what would you say, you know, I, I talk a lot, at least in the social media space about building a strong foundation to have a superstructure. Like you've got to have foundational pieces to be able to build and sustain, I think, a business. I'm curious what your advice would be for businesses like foundationally, what do they need to be successful? Well, you know, you know there, it, all, it does depend on what industry you're in, uh, but you know, the, a lot of the scalability is about people and having people that you can scale and certainly having a market big enough that what you do, what you're doing for your current clients, you can do the same thing for a lot more clients or do more for the same client. So there, there, it has to be an industry where there's room to grow. And then the toughest thing for an entrepreneur uh, or, you know, any business owner is, you know, they tend to do a lot themselves, right? And how do you get to the point where you are able to have people, you're uh, doing things that you used to do yourself. And that is, really hard and, and and a lot of business owners never accomplish that right they never get over that hump and you know there's a lot of things about you know bringing in the right people giving them the right long-term incentives nurturing them mentoring them you know recognizing that you know communications is really hard that you know they, they don't read minds particularly well you know so um you have to be able to communicate effectively and, you know, not micromanage and allow people to make mistakes and uh, pick the right industry which, which uh, supports grow growth. So yeah, you know, that's a, in a nutshell. And th all those are hard. Hiring the right people uh, that are scalable, that are teachable, somebody like you, you know, that is very teachable and passionate and, uh, you know, all those are important. So it's, it's a combination. Yeah. And strategy. You have to have a strategy for growth as well. Right. You know, and that's another tough thing because sometimes people uh, in, in their effort to grow, uh, they spread themselves too thin. You know, it's kind of like the risk game. If you spread your armies too thin, you basically can't defend your territory and some a competitor can come in and, and, and take business away. Right. It's, uh, so you have to really think about not spreading yourself too thin, but you know, providing things, uh, providing services that you can provide to a number of people without changing too much. Like your focus is on independent retail. And, and so there's a lot of independent retailers and it takes, uh, you know, certain things are common to those retailers, certain 
trends. And, and so if you learn it once, if it, if it works in Peoria, it probably works in Albuquerque, right? And, and that's a big advantage for growth, right? That you, that you can go in and uh, provide service to more people uh, in, because it's similar to what you're doing now. Right. Right. You know, I feel like it's this balancing act because you're trying to do so much to your point, like you're building this business. You're, I feel like as fast as you can, you need team members that can take some of the tasks away from the owner, like you were saying, because it's pretty easy to get caught up in all the to do's that you don't think about the strategy. Like there's no time for planning the vision and where we're going and how we're going to get there. And I just see a lot of businesses do that, myself included. It's hard to kind of balance, but would you agree? Is it? I often hear people say like, um, hire as soon as you can. Like that's one of the best things that you can start with. Do you agree with that? Probably not. No. Like, you know, sometimes people, you know, you, if you're, if you're starting something new, you know, they, uh, they may want to hire a salesperson right away. And, you know, a lot, a lot of times it's advantageous for them to learn how to sell the product first. Right. And because right. it's hard to train somebody if you don't know how to do it yourself. Right. right? And, but I think, you know, it, the most important time for strategy is at the beginning because you know, the stakes are much lower at the beginning. If you're really thinking about it, you know, and, uh, you know, sometimes you start, you start down a path that is basically doomed to failure because it's the wrong business or, you know, you know, it, you know, you, so thinking, spending time up front to really come up with, it's like the scientific method. You come up with a hypothesis and then you test it. You go out and test it in the marketplace and you can do it fairly small when you don't have a lot of overhead right yet. And, and then you can monitor, certainly every strategy is going to get tweaked. And it is important, Crystal, for you and for anybody else to, you know, step back and, you know, think about where, where you want to go based on the new information that you have. What information have you received from customers? What feedback have you gotten? And, you know, how does that modify your strategy? So you're always thinking strategy. You're always Try to pull yourself out of the weeds at least a, a few hours every week, uh, and you know, for for retailers, uh, your clients, something like this is always a good thing to to do to invest time and then really try to apply. Like if I'm one of your listeners, you listen to something like this. If you if you have a small business, take 30 minutes after listening to this recording. And write down how it might apply. You know what, you know what is different. And certainly, you know if you get one idea, you know that's a significant thing. But up front, you come up with a hypothesis, and you can't. And you have to be recognize that you know just like any tests in science, your hypothesis may prove wrong, right? And yet, and, and try something else. So don't be too wed to whatever your theory was at the beginning, because the market is going to tell you, right? And uh, you know, certainly the other challenge at the beginning is whether it's a product line or if it's, you know, you don't have, have many resources. So you start with something small, and you say, if this works, I could try this and and you know, try that. So it's very important to spend time thinking of strategy. Yeah. No question about it. No question. And be able to articulate it to somebody. Right. 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 Uh, you know, if you can't, you know, there are so many small business people that really don't have a strategy. Right. right? They, they can't articulate it. You know, if your strategy is word of mouth, that's not bad. Right. You know, that, that's a big factor in many, many companies. But you have to have a lot more than that. Right. To, to grow a business. Absolutely. Well, and so that's, of course, foundational. And then that, I mean, it's it's key to really helping scale the business too, right? So getting really clear early at the beginning of what we're going to do 
and learning the roles you need to so you can train them and market testing and making sure that this is a viable business idea or product. And then, you know, you're, you learn through doing and you're working and building. And then there comes a point where you're ready to scale. And for some, that happens faster than others. I think that I, for me at Crystal Media, I've had the business for nine years and we've like grown a little, grown a little, grown a little, took a little step back, grew, took a little step back and grew. We had our best year last year and we'll have our best year this year, thankfully. Um, but from a congratulations, scaling, like, we, yay, best year last you, year, yay, in the middle of a pandemic, best year. I know. I, I am nice. so incredibly grateful that uh, our retailers reached out to us. I mean, they couldn't stay in contact with their customers, so they needed to use social, and we were there to help support them. So um, that it was a good industry to be in during a pandemic. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm grateful. I'm so ready. I feel like I've been kind of ready for the past couple of years to just go further, you know, and that requires a few things. I mean, it requires me to think differently, I feel like. But what would you say, whether it's to me or an established business who's just kind of been growing gradually, if they're ready to scale the business and really go out next few levels, like what does it take to do that? Well, a lot has to do with, you know, where your business is right now. So, for example, if you have, you know, 5% of the market and there's no big competitor in your way and all you, you know, what you, what you really need to do is make more people aware of what you, who you are, right? That's one thing. And that says, okay, we need to beef up our marketing, yeah. right? Or we need to beef up our sales or we need to beef up both, right? And I always talk about how marketing and sales need to be integrated. But for many small businesses, that's one person. You just bring in a person or, you know, that, you know, to take you to the next level in marketing to do better digital marketing. And certainly that's the space that, that both of us are in right now right. is digital marketing and digital marketing does facilitate scaling the business if you do it well, right? Whether it's uh, social media marketing, digital advertising, uh, which is, you know, it, it is very complicated digital advertising. And so you definitely, you know, don't want to just try it yourself. You really want to talk to somebody that knows how to do it uh, or email marketing. If, you know, if you're business to business in particular, email marketing, but there's a lot of different components of digital marketing that could be scaled. And certainly there's physical marketing that could be scaled. You could be do, do more trade shows or you could do whatever, or you could in a retail model, you open a new store, right? You could do whatever it is you can do. If, if, if the market is there, you need to reach it and you have a concept, then that is uh, usually a matter of scaling up marketing and sales, which isn't trivial, but, you know, it's like my last company, when I took over the company, we had one and a half salespeople. We ended up with 10 wow. and we were able to scale up pretty dramatically our revenues because of that and our profits. And when we sold the company, we got a great return you know, for everybody, for the employees for the shareholders, but the key to that scaling was to scale our marketing and sales. Of course, we kept improving our product as well. You have to keep uh, improving your product, but if we hadn't scaled the marketing and sales, you know, we would not have been able to grow our revenues like we did. Right? So that's one. Now, one of the temptations a lot of people have is they think they kind of get bored of their market they're in now. Right. And rather than invest in in increasing your market share within that market, which could also be adding extra services that you're providing. So, you, you know, you, you know, you can look at your customer and say, how much 
are my customers spending a year on blank, right? It could be on digital marketing, on marketing in general. If you're a retailer, you think, you know, you have to think, you know, how much does somebody, how much could they spend, you know, when they come, when they come into the business or whatever, that's similar to what you're doing now. All of that is expanding within your current model, right? And, but there is a temptation sometimes to go, you know, there's a saying, the grass is often greener on the other side of the fence. Right. And uh, sometimes you think, well, this other market over here, that looks easy. And you go there and depending on how far it is from your core, it's very risky, right? Because, you know, it's hard to be for a small business to be great at one thing. It's close to impossible to be great at two things. Mm. And I have seen companies lose their way because they tried something that was pretty far away from their core. So, so you really need to think about that, right? When you, when you uh, think the key to growth is to go into a different market. And, and one of the questions you can ask yourself is, are the competitors in that different market totally different? Because if they are, you're not necessarily, you have to do a lot of research up front because uh, because sometimes you think, well, that, you know, my product that I have, you know, it works because I got one company to buy it or in that other space. But what, what a lot of times you don't know what you don't know. And there's a lot of competition or, or buyer needs. The buyer need the buyer needs are different in every industry space. And I, and I, th- I would imagine, I know it's in retail, that's true too. Like, you know, if you're specializing in one thing, you try to, you want to go into this other area with a different buyer, right? If it's the exact same buyer and it's the same kind of thing and it's related, that's one thing. You know, if it's a, if it's a different buyer, then you, know, you may or may not, uh, that's a little riskier. The least risky is to have something that is working well uh, and expand that through marketing and sales, assuming that the market is there, right? right? Uh, but that sometimes in order to, to truly realize your potential, you do need to go into markets. And if you go into contiguous markets, it's less risky than if you try to do something dramatically different. You know, or, you know again, I've, I've been involved with a lot of technology companies and if you try to do something, it's a dramatically different technology, and you try to build that yourself, that's risky. And so you always have to think the, 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 the exact circumstances that you're in. But for most of the people listening, you know, it, you know expanding their core business, either by, you know, doing more, if, if, if you've got a, a digital, uh, you know, if, if you've got a, if you've got an e-commerce website, and you want to expand that, well, certainly you could expand it with digital advertising, you know, so you bring in a digital. So it's not just SEO. SEO is important. SEO is really important, but digital advertising can pay off too right. because you're, you know, more people that would be, you know, whether if it's a Google ad, what keywords are they typing in, right, or whatever, and Facebook, what kinds of people are you targeting and, and all of that. Yeah. So, you know, for a lot of businesses, expanding could mean just expanding your advertising budget. If, you know, but again, that's something that you really need to think about and talk to somebody. And there are risks associated with that because any expert that you hire is going to cost you money. So you really have to think about, can you afford it? Is this the right year to do that? Right. Uh, you know, right. So all of those things go into it. So when you're thinking of scaling up, certainly there's a lot of thought that goes mm-hmm. into it. I have a friend uh, that uh, is in a completely different business. And you know, we talked nine months ago and the key to her growth, uh, she had two separate markets that she was in, but was to hire a marketing person because she wasn't really doing any marketing. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, so, you know, she hired a marketing person and it's been going very well. 
in terms of, you know, expanding and you take it to the next step, you know, uh, and again, email marketing for any business to business, you know, that's, you know, a very important component. Web webinars, seminars, uh, conferences, trade shows. Uh, so you, you really do have to think, but come up with a strategy. And again, I think the, the biggest lesson that I want your listeners to get out of it is any strategy is really a test, mm. right? So you come up with a test, uh, you know, hypothesis, you give it a test, what did you learn from it? And modify, right? So it's a provisional strategy. And then what happens is as the test, you get results, and if the results are paying off, the strategy becomes more mm -hmm. solid, right? In the beginning, it's, you know, it's an experiment. Everything's a test in, in marketing, right? right? And so you got to think about that. It may be hiring a salesperson, uh, but you also, if you hire somebody, you have to think about what is it going to take from me to get that person ramped up and make that commitment. Uh, and, you know, certainly they have to show that they're capable of ramping up. And I always use the term teachable, that they're teachable, that they have the right level of energy or passion and that the, the you know, the incentives are aligned. So if it's a salesperson, you know, what kind of uh, variable compensation are you going to give them so that their, you know, what, what their behavior matches what the, what the company needs? Right. Man, Ted, I feel like I could just listen to you for hours. You have so much good advice. I mean, that, what you shared in just that one answer, there is so much gold there. Just to point out a couple things, like what I love about strategy being a test feels not as like so in stone that this is exactly the way it has to be. And I feel like some businesses don't have the flexibility. It's easier when you're smaller, but to go into it of testing it, then we're really monitoring and tracking to see how things are working to then decide, is this solid and we move forward or do we need to tweak it? So that was a big takeaway for me. Also, marketing, like I was just talking to my friend who has a photography business and her and I were both saying like, she, she never markets. We market here at Crystal Media, but we're not great at it. And I think that's one of our number one ways that we could be scaling. I look at our retailers and they're the same way. Often we're like so caught up in the doing that it's not always people's first thought or their strength with marketing to where these amazing businesses become the best kept secret. Like nobody knows about them. <laughs> right. A lot of times the best product does not win. A product is important, right? But the, but, and, and you have a great product that you provide your customers, Crystal, but the product is, is part of the equation. But then you know, you do have to market it. And, you know, that, that movie did a tremendous disservice. And, you know, the, the saying, if you build it, they will come. You know, whether it's a retailer, whether it's a website, uh, whether it's a, uh, you know, consulting, a marketing consulting business for small retailers or any other business, you have to go find those customers. I mean, I haven't checked on Google's revenues lately, but I know they're way over a hundred billion. Uh, and the reason why they got so big is because they're finding people at the exact moment when they're shopping, right? You know, if, if somebody is looking, I, I don't know what that thing is behind you. Is it an image of a, it's an dog image drinking of drinking wine. <laughs> what is that picture? A dog drinking wine. So if somebody, if you're in the business of selling pictures of dogs drinking wine and somebody goes into Google and types pictures of dogs drinking wine, they are a pretty good prospect for your right. business, right? And obviously there's a lot, you know, within Google, you know, you're paying for keywords and there's all sorts of complexities, but those are people that are actually looking for that. If somebody types that in, which I will probably <laughs> never do, uh, but, 
you know, maybe a cat uh, yeah. drinking wine or, you know, <laughs> or, uh, you never know. But uh, but in any event, you know, you think about that. If you build it, they will not come unless you market yeah. it effectively. And certainly sales, you know, you know, sales and marketing, they they go hand in hand depending on the business. But the first thing is to find somebody that's interested in right. what you have, right? And you know, you know, so you know, digital advertising is, is big on that. You know, when you do an email market, you know, your email marketing, and again, that's particularly important in the business to business realm. When you're doing email marketing and you get 15% open rate and you get certain people uh, to click on it or whatever it is, you know, they're interested. Or you can look at their digital body language and you see that somebody opened your email 27 times. Right? That's interesting. That's, you know, that, that's the sort of thing that uh, tells you that person is interested. And you know, the whole purpose of marketing is to find interested right. people, right? And uh, to and certainly the, you got to think if you're in a retail, think about the signage that you have. Think about you know where where you're whether you're advertising at the local high school or whatever it is. And but it's all a test. Certainly, everything's a test. And you know when it comes to things like that, it's not a test that lasts right. a month. It might be a test that lasts a year, and you know. You, and, but you also one of one of the interesting things that you know has really come, uh, you know, has, has been reinforced uh, with me in the, in the last year or so is one of the things you, you one needs to do in marketing these days in digital marketing uh, is make it easy for the consumer to do what you want them to do, right? So. Uh, you know, if you're if you're digital marketing uh, for an orthodontist, which is something that I'm doing now, and you know, an orthodont, you know, for 500 of them around the country. But if you're digital mar marketing for an orthodontist, consumers make it easy for consumers to schedule an appointment. If you want to have more appointments, make it easy. Click a button, see the available time, schedule the appointment. Right. You make it easy for consumers to do what you want them to do, and more of them will do it. Right, and that is true for your clients in the retail space. It's true for your business. You know, how do you make it easy? If it's is it a fifteen minute consultation that you're you're marketing? What are you marketing when you do those emails, or what are you marketing when you do your Google ads? Yeah, make it easy. And uh, by the way, in the Google ads or just the ads in general, you definitely don't want to connect back to your website. You want to connect back to a landing page so that the, that the consumer sees content there that's relevant to the ad that you just showed, right? Not sort of general, here's my web page. But, but anyway, it's another lesson. Make it easy for consumers to do what you want them to do. And Absolutely. more of them will do it. Absolutely. Right? So, uh, I, I love it, Ted. I mean, so with the landing, the ad to the landing page, uh, retailers or business owners listening, think of a funnel. If you're an insider member, we got some training on that. Um, but the top of the funnel, right, might be that ad that takes to the landing page and then there's further communication from there. And then you confuse, you lose. Right? Like if you make it challenging, you lose. If you confuse in your copy, in your marketing copy, like, yeah. Confuse, yeah. You so lose. you got to make sure you're really clear. And then I also once heard um, best, best known is better than best. You could be the best at what you do. Best but if, known. Yeah. Best known is better than best. I like that. Yeah. So yeah, you also have to think about what somebody is buying. Right. There was a, 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 a marketing professor at Harvard Business School that I knew named Ted Levitt. And he always he talked about when somebody in the industrial space bought, bought a drill press, what they really were buying were holes. That's what they needed. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, retail, you think about the image that you're trying to project or, you know, what is that person? Or if you're buying a car, the brand, it's not just four wheels to get someplace. It's a... Mm -hmm. 
it, it's a perception you know, that you're conveying, right? And so you always want to think about that. What are they buying? And, and when you're talking about your product, you need to make sure to talk about what they really need, not the mechanics of what you're delivering, right? right. So you really want to think about that as well. Uh, so obviously there's a lot here, but the, the main thing is to think about all these things when you're coming up with a strategy and it's much easier to grow your existing product or service within your existing space if the market is big enough by adding marketing. Right. right. Ted, I want to talk a little bit about risk taking because, you know, you mentioned as you scale a business that if you were going, you know, business owners get bored and they try different things and they go into different markets and doing some of that might not be the best way to scale. And it might in fact be pretty risky. You know, I, Dustin always says to me, I'm not a big risk taker. I'm not, he's a big risk taker. He'll spend a lot on advertising. He'll do all sorts of stuff. And I kind of play it safe. What, what do you think is the importance in taking risks in building a business? Like, do you, I mean, I just am curious your thoughts on risk taking. Well, it's impossible to build a business and take no risks, right? right. And you're always taking the career risk, the opportunity cost uh, of what you could have earned someplace else, right? right. And, uh, but you're also taking a financial risk. One of the things I've seen is when people go after other markets, that they don't know, they massively underestimate the risk. Mm. And that's the because they think, well, we, if we could just get one customer, two customer, three customer, but it's usually much more risky than that, right? And so, and that's the whole purpose of thinking about it, it is a test, that you test it. If you take a little risk, you test it. Now, hiring a marketing person is a risk. And so, you know, that, you know, maybe that's a hundred thousand dollar risk or, you know, whatever it is, depending on the market you're in, you know, and, but so the question is, can you take that risk? You have to think before you even start down that path. You also, and you also have to think, well, if I do that, this person is going to want to spend some money, right? You know, so you can't, so you want to, you, you, you want to weigh the risk accurately as best you can at the beginning and test things a little bit. Like you could hire somebody as a consultant. That's a lower risk. And if it works out, they could become full-time. By the way, for many people, it's a lower risk for the consultant too, right? So they're there because they don't know how well they're gonna work with you or whatever. So, you know, hiring somebody as a consultant and seeing how well you get along, you know, it's a littler risk. So. You can certainly moderate your risks and, you know, it makes sense to do that because you know, this isn't, you know, you know, in order to be an entrepreneur, you know, it's not the equivalent of going to Vegas, mortgaging your house and putting it all on number 12 on the roulette wheel, right? right. Not a good idea. Although there is a story about Fred Smith, the founder of Federal Express, he couldn't make payroll. So he, he went to Vegas and he put up, you know, you know, a, a, you know, he took a huge risk and he made enough money to make payroll. Oh, and, and of course, the rest is history. And I don't know if that's true or wow. not, but that is the story that I've heard. But in general, I'm not a big fan <laughs> of mortgage your house kind of risks. Right. I would rather take incremental risks, thinking, my, you know, accurately uh, measuring the risk. And sometimes you don't know, like, you know, you, you start down a path, you don't know 100%. So you have to be intellectually honest when you look at the results. Like, what is the market telling you so far? Is this thing going to work? And a lot of times you're extrapolating on a very limited set of data. And, and, but, and you shouldn't, like, you, you shouldn't market. If you're going to invest in Google Ads, you shouldn't think I'm going to try it for a month, right? right? You know, you just, that isn't going to work, right? You just know that that's throwing the money away. You say, so, okay, I'm going to invest X number of thousands of dollars over six months, or I'm going to do this, right? You know, so you make the decision up front, but you still look at it as a test. 
looking at the results and making sure you have a good way of measuring the results, which is very hard to do in marketing. It, you know, the, that's the reality is you have to look at the interim results as well. Whether you had more appointments, did you get more appointments scheduled, right? What, uh, and usually all these things typically pay off over longer than six months. So that's a tougher thing. You could hire a marketing person tomorrow, Crystal, and you probably wouldn't, you know, after about six months, you'd have a gut feeling whether this was a good investment and that, but you probably wouldn't see the returns until it's a year. I mean, that's sad reality, but if you don't do that, then you don't get the, you don't grow. Right. right? You know, at the end of the day, you have to make investments to grow. Right. right? So, well, and we're uh, in this instant gratification world, right? Like I want to see my results today. I want my answers now. And so it really is the long game versus the short game where the long game is only a six to 12 month. That's not even that long. Right. And of course, depending on industry and budget, things can take longer, but um, you know, it really is about being patient and being committed, I think, and, and consistent to an effort and really measuring. Measuring yeah. it. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. And knowing, like having a budget, like in your own mind, I'm willing to invest. And I've seen plenty of people that don't grow because they're not willing to right. invest. Right? I remember, you know, a hundred years ago, early in my career, uh, before I met you, uh, I was in this business where, you know, we were selling uh, marketing uh, to uh, contract manufacturers. And there was like this one in Ohio that we went to and he didn't, he hadn't grown. And one of his employees left, started a competitor and started marketing and was like 10 times okay. bigger. And I remember talking to the, the, the original founder and he was looking at that. He said, I just never could take the risk. I never was willing to do that. And he, you know, and he got the reward, right? You know, right. uh, you know, he didn't sow, so he didn't reap, right? right? You know, and the, uh, the other guy was, you know, buying houses in the Virgin Islands and, you know, just, uh, you know, living the good life because he had invested in both infrastructure and yeah. in marketing. Well, and I think that's where part of the success comes in is knowing your strengths and your weaknesses, because if he was just not uh, strong in marketing and not willing to invest, could he have had a partner that came on? Could that employee have been a partner instead of spinning off and doing his own thing? Like just really kind of being self-aware and then surrounding yourself with a good team. Well, yeah, he could have, you know, the, the future was not written. That person that left might have stayed if he had cut him in with a little piece of the equity or, right. you know, or, you know, who knows, but uh, you know, I do think that uh, knowing your strengths are important, but I also think that it's also important for small business people. Like if, if you're not good at, uh, you know, finance, if you're not good at looking at the profitability statements, the P&Ls, you should try to get better. Yeah. Right? If you're not good at marketing, you should try to learn. And that might be using somebody like you, right, okay. as a consultant, right? The But... It is, you know, if you're a small business person, you need to at least have some understanding of all the different things that affect whether or not your business will be successful. Right. So thinking about how profitability works. And you know, I've known many small business people that just kind of say, oh, you know, the numbers aren't my thing and they never try to learn them. And that's a mistake. Right you know, in terms of scaling the business, right? You're not going to be a, a you know, world-class, you know, financial person. And you certainly don't want to become an accountant. That's somebody else's job. But understanding how the numbers work is important. And understanding marketing a little bit is important. You know, getting better every day at these things, yeah. right? While you're also doing the, whatever it is that you that you are good at, right? So, totally. Uh, that in, in certainly bringing people in that you can learn from uh, is important as well. Yeah. Awesome. Ted, I have four rapid fire questions for you as we wrap up this awesome interview that I'm so glad that we got to do. 
Um, my, <laughs> my, yeah, it's so fun. My first question is, what is a time that you were proud of yourself professionally or personally? Well, I'm proud when we sold my last company, Touchtown, because every employee got the biggest paycheck of their lives. And it was something that, you know, we worked for, not just selling the company, but, you know, we had to set things up with stock options and whatnot so that that could happen. And, uh, you know, the company is doing really well now. Uh, you know, I stayed a year and the company is continuing to do really well. And, and you know, one, you know, there's a book called Good to Great, which is a great book for business people. Yeah. And they, they talk about the measure of a, of a great company is one that does well after you leave. Right. right? And, you know, if, if it falls apart when you leave, you, you haven't done your job right. right, right, in terms of, you know, making, you know, setting it up so that the, the company has the right people in place uh, so that you can leave. And, uh, you know, that's what happened at Touchtown. And, I'm very proud of that. That what an amazing experience, and I'll never forget um, your father. He didn't he manage like four thousand employees and was a very respected uh, leader. Yeah, my father uh, started a company called Chemonix, uh, C H E M O N I C S dot com, and they're the number one, I believe, uh, provider of foreign aid services around the world for the U.S. government. Uh, so, you know, they do everything from AIDS eradication uh, and dealing with famine in Africa uh, to health care in Bangladesh. Uh, and, you know, they have people all over the world. And it's about a billion dollars or so in revenue. Uh, and I'm very proud of it. He died 16 years ago. The company is, you know, he started with one guy on the telephone. Now it's thousands of employees. Uh, so yeah. he's, he did very well. Right? And he I'm did. proud of him. Yeah. yeah. I, I always remember that. And working with you um, at Snap Retail, I just always felt that desire to take care of the team and really build something we can all be a part of. And so, um, which I just loved and try to be like as well. That was very impactful um, working with you through well, that. I learned that from my dad. You know, he always yeah. put the company above him, himself. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in you know, people work for him for 30 years, right? You know, so. Love it. Um, okay, next rapid fire question. Uh, what social media site do you use the most? It's probably Facebook. Uh, you know, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn all the time. And certainly personally, but also professionally. Yeah. Uh, you know, in terms of, the professional with Facebook uh, and Instagram are just people that, you know, I built a good relationship with that, you know, has blended into the personal. Totally. Yeah. That's a pure curiosity. Not, I know you were, you were the, the queen of Twitter. <laughs> I remember one time you were ranked like number 10 or something. I had a Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah. And, I, uh, yeah. A, uh, Good memory. Yeah, Me and so Shaquille O'Neal were in a magazine together. And Twitter, Twitter is important because for SEO purposes, right? Uh, Google indexes Twitter and not Facebook and Instagram. I think they, uh, you know, they don't like Facebook and Instagram <laughs> as much. I guess you know, I don't know why. Right. But they they do index Twitter, so it's good to in the B two B space to be posting to Twitter. Right. Right. Um, yeah. what have you listened to a podcast or read a book in the past 30 days that you would recommend? The thing I would recommend, uh, that, you know, there's something called, because, you know, I certainly listen to my industry podcast and, uh, general podcasts, uh, but there's something called blink list. Do you know blink list? Oh, no. Uh, I feel like I've heard about this, but I'm not sure what it is. Or blinkist. My daughter, Emily got it for me for, uh, Christmas, I think, a subscription or my birthday. And basically they take books and they, you know, they, they give you the summary of the book in 15 minutes. Oh. And they, they're called blinks and they're like, they'll, they'll take a book and make eight or nine blinks. And certainly if you had time to read business books or even novels, 
I, you know, there was a book about Robert Iger's, why he was able to just transform Disney. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure I would learn more if I took the 20 hours or 25 hours to read the book. But the 15 minute summary was pretty helpful. And, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, Michelle Obama's book in 15 minutes or, you know, books on business topics or, you know, there's there's a, a whole bunch on, on you know, multiple books on uh, the importance of storytelling in business, you know, or storytelling in leadership, where explaining a policy by telling a story mm. and, and how that's affected. But all of those were just little 15 minute blinks I listened to. So I got the essence of the book uh, quickly. Yeah. And you can always listen to it again if you you didn't, right? Uh, I'm going to be. So th- I, I would recommend that. Yeah, right? I'm going to be. It's a little, it's an app. Okay. I'm gonna, I'll get the name right Blinkist, here Blinkist, and we'll we'll confirm too. We'll look it Blinkless, up. Blinkist. 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 I'm going to be addicted to that. I love Blinkist. Blinkist. Uh, no L. Okay. B-I-L. Love it. I-N-K-I-S-T. Love it. Fun fact about Robert Iger. Um, when he when his book came out, I was at the Ellen show in the audience and he was one of the guests and we all got a copy of his book. I wish it was signed, but um, I haven't read it yet, but I'm going to probably listen to it on Blinkist. Listen, listen to the Blink. <laughs> I know. Yeah. You know, time is so precious that you know yeah. most of us don't have a time to read right. any books you know so this is a way to extract the wisdom from the books totally ted do you have any parting advice for our audience as we sign up sign off here well you know i think that you always want to think about your business be intellectually honest and i guess in in terms of when you do have employees Try not to be defensive when they have ideas, because if if you create an environment where people believe they can share their ideas with you, whether or not you eventually implement them, but if they believe that you will share your ideas or you will listen to them, they'll be happier, but the company will be stronger. And there are so many small businesses that are not run that way. There's so many small businesses where if a team member makes a suggestion that the the owner or the manager reacts defensively or explains why they are doing what they are doing, and no matter no matter what, you should just let it come in, just let it come in and reflect on it and give feedback the next day or a reaction the next day. But that is a if you want to scale and it involves people. The single biggest weakness that I see in most small business owners is the fact they react defensively uh, when they get suggestions. Beautifully said. Excellent advice, Ted. Uh, For anybody... Now, you're obviously niche like I am too. You work with orthodontists at Kaleidoscope. Um, So if anybody is an orthodontist, tell them where they can check you out. Well, it's the thekaleidoscope.com. And feel free to find me on LinkedIn. You can see my name right there, Ted Teal. Uh, find me on LinkedIn. And uh, But, yes, right now we're focused, you know, really we're a complete digital marketing company for orthodontists. And it's really fascinating to me to learn because it's all about local marketing uh, and, put in their case, putting – uh, what I, I say, butts in the seats, people in the seats for consultations, because it's usually free. Consultations are usually free, and uh, you know before you uh, decide whether you want to get braces or aligners. So we got to get good qualified people into the seats, and marketing is critical for that. So, and I'm having a blast uh, doing it, and uh, it's great talking to you, Crystal. Uh, again. I'll I'll end where I I started. I'm very proud of the fact that you've had your business for nine years and you had your best year ever uh, in 2020. Well, Ted, I mean, I learn from the best 
just, you are one of those people. I really learned so much when we work together and continue to, and I thank you for your support and um, inspiration of just being an awesome leader and entrepreneur. This means the world to me that you spent the past hour with me. Thank you so much. We will link to Ted's information. Go check him out. Ted, thank you so much for your time. You are very One last welcome. cheers. And everybody, I will cheers. see you on the next see you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. Are you on Instagram? I'd love to see pictures of you listening to the show, a screenshot of your favorite episode, and or your favorite wines. Share them with me. Just follow and tag at Crystal Uncorked. I can't wait to see you there. All right. I'll see you on the next see you.